Hi everyone. Um, welcome to the postgrad um, lecture series that I'm presenting today. Just want to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that I'm on today, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Lake Nation, and pay my respect to the elders past, present and emerging. So today I want to talk about um, the genetics and genomics and transcriptomics um, used to diagnose and treat primary immunodeficiency disorders. So we'll start with the basics. Uh, primary immunodeficiencies or PIDs are a collection of more than 420 rare disorders um, that are characterized by an impaired ability to produce a normal immune response. And this typically results in recurrent or severe infections. So importantly, they are distinct from secondary or acquired immunodeficiencies in that they're not caused by other diseases, other treatments or environmental exposure to toxins. They're mostly genetic disorders and many are diagnosed in children <clears throat> in their first year of life. Now, I just told you this is a collection of more than 400 immune disorders, so it's not going to come as a surprise that primary immunodeficiencies have variable uh, variability in their disease onset, severity, um, and of course, therapies and managements, um, many with overlapping clinical phenotypes. So they may present clinically as severe, persistent, unusual, or recurrent infections, or even unexplained inflammation. So I have a couple of key examples of these below. Um, the most famous example of X-linked um, SCID, which I'll walk through in a moment, um, but they also include defects in particular immune pathways. So, for example, for most of us, you know, infection with um, a herpes simplex virus will cause um, an irritating cold sore. But for kids born with mutations in the TLR3 or TRAF3 pathway, this leads to a, a devastating encephalitis. Um, or there's some of the work I was involved in um, during my postdoc, which was identifying new gene, gene causes for fungal infections, um, resulting in the difficult to treat chronic mucocutaneous candidiasis, or um, some of my work and others in um, IL-12 receptor genes as a new genetic cause for um, Mendelian susceptibility to mycobacteria disease and tuberculosis. So the most extreme form of primary immunodeficiency is severe combined immunodeficiency or SCID. So you may be aware um, of SCID from its most famous patient, David Vetter, um, also known as the boy in the bubble. So I have a link here below to um, a, a film from the New York Times about David K David's case for those um, who are interested. Um, David's form of SCID um, presented in a complete absence of many of his immune cells. So complete absence of T cells um, and no NK cells and very little antibody. So he actually entered a sterile chamber minutes after his birth and he stayed in a sterile environment until two weeks before his death um, at the age of 12. And the reason that the doctors were ready for this was that he had an older brother who died from the same disorder at seven months old. Um, at the time, the management plan for David was to place him in isolation temporarily until um, he underwent a bone marrow transplantation, um, which was a relatively new um, treatment at the time. But unfortunately, his prospective donor, his sister Catherine, was not actually a HLA match. Um, David lived his life um, mostly at Texas Children's Hospital um, until the age of three. Um, and then he entered a specialised chamber that was purpose built um, in his home. And, and NASA also built um, mobile suits, one of which was, was used um, and is shown here. Um, eventually, he did undergo a, him, a bone marrow transplantation. Um, as the um, HLA mismatching um, um, evolved over time, but sadly, um, he he did um, die shortly afterwards um, due to a complication um, in in CMV um, infection in his sister that was undetected at the time. So, obviously, we we learned a lot about bone marrow transplantation um, from a case like David. Um, but we also learned a lot about primary immunodeficiency. So David had the most common form of SCID, X-linked 
um, SCID. We now know this is due to mutations in a gene encoding the common gamma chain of IL-2, um, which is encoded on the X chromosome. And as I said, we've come a long way since then. We know there are different forms of SCID. Um, we've characterized the underlying genetic causes of, of well over 90% of these SCID cases, and it can be cured if it's treated early with a stem cell transplant to replace the whole immune system in the first few months of life. Now, diagnosis of SCID in Australia is usually following presentation of a sick newborn with infections, and diagnosis is made following investigations such as um, a complete um, blood counts, lymphocyte counts, um, testing serum antibody levels, and usually this is then followed by genetic testing um, of a panel of genes. Of course, with the family history of SCID, um, there's also the option of pre-implantation -im, pre or in utero screening can also be performed. But in the US and many countries worldwide, uh, newborn screening for SCID is actually standard care. Um, with the exception of a pilot study in New South Wales, there is no newborn screening program here in Australia for SCID, um, but we're certainly working hard to change that. Um, I'm leading a petition um, in Victoria in collaboration with the Immune Deficiency Foundation of Australia, and there are others um, doing similar efforts across the country. And this is because we know that accurate early diagnosis of SCID improves patient outcomes. In fact, when we diagnose and perform stem cell transplant before a baby is three months old, specifically uh, before this skid baby has any infection, there's a high likelihood of excellent outcomes with more than 95% survival rate. But for this to happen and a donor to be arranged this quickly, um, the baby must be diagnosed early. And that can only happen if, for example, it's a second sibling or via a newborn screening program. So for babies who are transplanted after three months, but are infection free at the time of transplant, they also do pretty well with about an 80% survival rate. Um, but th for those babies who have had a delayed transplant, who have acute infections, only half survive to the age of five. And there is close to 100% mortality um, if no transplant is made. So we know in this extreme form of primary immunodeficiency, early diagnosis is essential. And the best way to diagnose is via genetic screens. So beyond SCID, for all of the other primary immunodeficiencies, um, an underlying genetic defect or inborn error in immunity has been identified for many. Um, globally, this is somewhere between 50 and 70% of cases. So if we look here at the cumulative number of primary immunodeficiency genes discovered by um, either conventional or next generation genomic sequencing approaches, it's clear the many advances we've made in recent years. So we now have close to 450 inborn areas of immunity that have been identified. Uh, most of the new cases now identified have been um, done so by exome or increasingly whole genome sequencing. And many of these diseases, you know, they're individually exceptionally rare, but collectively they account for significant disease. And of course, our understanding of these rare disorders gives precious insight into the new ways we can treat other more common and, and obviously genetically more complex immune diseases. So if we look at the different categories of primary immunodeficiency, most are actually antibody deficiencies. The proportion of this might differ slightly from country to country, but it's always um, above 50%. And this data is actually from our own cohort of Victorian patients with primary immunodeficiency. And if we break this down further, the majority of um, antibody deficiencies are actually called uh, a condition called common variable immunodeficiency or CVID. So we've known for a long time that common variable immunodeficiency or CVID is a clinically heterogeneous disorder. And the reason for this is basically it's likely a collection of many different disorders. Um, together, they're very difficult to treat or they can be difficult to treat. And they really span the spectrum of monogenic and, and polygenic disease. So 
Um, some features of CVID. CVID has a variable age of disease onset. It often occurs in childhood or teenage years, but it can actually occur at any age. Uh, typical features include hypogamma globulinemia or reduced serum IgG, and for 50% of patients, also IgM and IgA. And patients usually typically also have recurrent bacterial infections and poor responses to vaccination due to their reduced levels of protective antibodies. So the first clinical presentation may be these recurrent infections, but it's equally likely it may be um, other inflammatory disease phenotype or even lymphoma that is the first presentation. And so because of this, patients are often seen by a series of specialists um, before diagnosis. The treatment for CVID is antibody replacement therapy. Now, this often comes in the form of intravenous infusions of immunoglobulin or IVIG or subcutaneous infusions, um, SCIG. These therapies are lifelong. Uh, they must be regularly administered, usually monthly or even fortnightly. And this is to make sure there's enough circulating protective antibodies in the blood. Now, each infusion treatment each month for the average person is actually the pooled serum of hundreds of different healthy donors to really um, recapitulate that protective immunity um, to all of the um, viruses and bacteria that we normally encounter. The antibody replacement infusions are usually administered in a hospital setting, um, the IVIG, and they require typically a day away from school or work. And of course, this is when patients are well. Diagnosis of CVID is not straightforward um, at all. Typically, it's a diagnosis of exclusion of other primary immunodeficiencies with those key features of hypogammaglobulinemia and impaired antibody response to vaccine challenge. Most patients have reduced or absent isotype switched memory cells, or equally, they could be normal. Um, so it's very difficult to diagnose, and CVID is particularly difficult to diagnose in young children under the age of four or five, given their normal immunological immaturity. <clears throat> And it's really because of all of these reasons that we commonly see long diagnostic delays in most patients. So a few years ago, we performed an audit of Australian patients, adult patients with antibody deficiency in Victoria um, at Royal Melbourne, Monash, Alfred and Austin Hospitals. And we identified a median diagnostic delay of nine years after the first onset of symptoms. And unfortunately, this is pretty typical of CVID. So there is evidence of this diagnostic delay shortening in recent years, um, but it still remains significant. Um, we know this is important and it causes um, measurable increase to the increased risk of mortality. So in this same study, we compared CVID patients to those with other antibody deficiency disorders and showed that only a small proportion of CVID patients, fewer than 30%, had what we called an infectious only phenotype. So this means that the majority of patients actually presented with at least one or multiple comorbidities. And I'm just showing here that these include um, many different um, complications under the broad categories of lymphoproliferation, autoimmune manifestations, um, gastrointestinal disease, and uh, solid or blood malignancies. So, of course, there's been many efforts in the last decades to, to stratify the CVID cohort based on clinical or, or cellular immunological phenotypes, but honestly, without much success in, in accelerating the diagnosis or predicting patient outcomes or prognosis or, or even identifying which groups are at greater, greater risk of developing particular comorbidities. Um, and unlike the other antibody deficiencies, the CVID patients uh, typically had more than one complication. And we know this is important because for those minority of patients with an infectious only phenotype, they do pretty well with replacement antibody therapy alone. But for the others, the majority, they experience repeated hospitalizations, generally poor outcomes, and all of this together translates to an average life expectancy of 44 to 48 years for women and men with CVID. So 
It is possible for, you know, the severe cases to undergo hemopoietic stem cell transplantation, but not usually with any reasonable amount of success. Um, there was a study a few years ago of CVID patients undergoing hemopoietic stem cell transplantation showing pretty poor survival. Um, mostly this is because of the delayed onset, the number of infections people are dealing with, and often transplantation is used as a last resort. So together they tend to have exceptionally poor outcomes. And this really leads us to the current state of knowledge of immunogenetics of primary immunodeficiency. You know, the severe early onset diseases are typically the best understood. And this is really because they're classically due to homozygous mutations that have an overt impact on immune system. Uh, for most, the molecular defect is defined, as is the treatment in many cases. For example, hemopoietic stem cell transplantation, or even increasingly gene therapy. But for the less severe primary immunodeficiencies, such as CVID, these are, are generally poorly understood and more prevalent. Um, they have a milder phenotype, they're often underdiagnosed, and they're often associated with onset in teenage years or early adulthood. Um, they present many treatment challenges and, and patients are often managed by multiple clinician specialists. Um, for those patients with other complications, and I've just told you that the majority, that's the majority of CVID patients, the antibody replacement therapy is insufficient. It just doesn't treat those non-infectious complications of disease. They're often managed instead by broad immunosuppression. And of course, this has a severe impact on an already compromised immune system. So it's really clear that we need to identify the underlying causes and mechanisms of this disease to inform the underlying biology, to make the most impact, improve diagnosis and management for patients living with this disease. But also, you know, we can use CVID as an exemplar of other more prevalent uh, complex immune diseases. And identifying the gene defects responsible for disease, we can use our immunological assays and transcriptomics to directly measure lymphocyte function in patients to pinpoint where the immune dysregulation is. You know, we often use the term virtuous cycle of gene discovery and clinical genomics because it really captures what we're trying to achieve and the necessity of aligning and integrating these often separate lines of investigations. So for primary immunodeficiency, discovery of the gene defect can lead to the uncovering of the pathophysiological disease mechanism, which can lead to targeted therapies for that particular patient as well as future patients with the same variants or the same gene mutation, um, um, or even those that present with defects in the same pathway. But equally, primary immunodeficiencies offer enormous insight into the normal functioning of our immune system, which influences our approaches to drug design, new therapies for many other disorders. And, you know, it's really that space between the basic immunology research and clinical immunology that I position myself sort of as a conduit to both of these worlds to directly link genetic variants with immune function and clinical disease. And I really think by taking this type of approach, we can get to a better resolution of diagnostics for these difficult to diagnose immune disorders. We can identify pathways and precision therapies for better outcomes for patients. And the key element of this cycle is that it always starts and ends with a patient. So before we get into the data, I'll show you this report. So it's from 1970. Uh, it was 10 years after the first reported case of CVID or dysgamma globulinemia, as it was called. Um, a group of immunologists formed a WHO working group. Uh, this now exists as an IUIS expert committee in inborn errors of immunity. And the group came together to classify and make recommendations about how we treat primary immunodeficiencies and this variable immunodeficiency group, which they um, astutely describe as presumably lumping together a series of syndromes. And that with careful analysis, we should be able to delineate several homogenous syndromes based on an established 
hereditary mechanisms or other etiologies. So, you know, 50 years on, we obviously still have a lot to achieve, but we also have new tools to take on this challenge. So the first genetic causes of CVID were discovered in the early 2000s. Uh, these were largely associated with an infectious only phenotype. Um, there was no new treatment options yet as a result of these discoveries. So these discoveries were largely based on family studies that took a candidate gene approach. So typically they performed linkage analysis on very large families, often with many um, um, patients, um, often refined areas of homozygosity within the genome, and then just Sanger sequenced gene by gene, aligning the gene sequences by eye, and then finding changes. So, you know, you can see this approach revealed a, a handful of CBID genes. And in the case of the, the TASI gene, um, actually a risk factor of CBID. So the mutations in the TASI gene don't alone cause disease, but they need to be in combination with another genetic mutation. So together, all of these discoveries account for about one to 5% of CBID cases. So 2010 really marked the beginning in applying a next generation sequencing approach to understand the genomics of primary immunodeficiency and, and CVID. You know, at this time, it costs um, 10,000 US dollars to sequence each exome. And now, of course, we're, we're well into the era of the thousand genome and, and falling. Um, here are just some of the CVID genes discovered since this time. Uh, some are now considered distinct primary immunodeficiencies from CVID. Some of these are in linked immune pathways, and I'll tell you about a couple of them today. And in some instances, these discoveries have been directly translated into targeted therapies. Now, of course, with increased coverage, you know, improved bioinformatic pipelines, we can uncover more mutations in, in less severe phenotypes. Um, and to start, I wanted to share a brief case study. The, the first family we sequenced in my group in uh, WeHi in 2013, because it really highlights the potential benefits of a genomic diagnosis that allows accurate diagnosis to occur and how understanding the basic biology can lead to precision therapies. You know, there may already be something available um, or of course we can develop new therapeutics um, and pathways to target and how it's transformative, not just for individual families, but can also change practice as well as our approach to clinical trials. So the family tree I'm showing here on the left um, is a mother with two daughters um, who have CBID. They also have autoimmune manifestations, they have thrombocytopenia, uh, neutropenia, and reduced uh, numbers of T cells and B cells. Pretty typical CBID family. Uh, Mum was diagnosed in her teens, and because of the family history, both girls were diagnosed very early um, at the age of two. So we identified a disease-causing mutation in a gene that encodes CXCR4. So this gene mutation does not affect protein expression, it does not affect binding, but it completely disrupts signaling and function of this important protein that directs uh, cell migration. So this result had a number of significant implications for this family. Um, the first of which is a re-diagnosis uh, 35 years later of a very, very rare primary immunodeficiency called WIM syndrome. And each of the letters stand for a different clinical feature of the syndrome. So the diagnosis was now based on a genetic diagnosis, despite the patients not technically meeting this clinical diagnostic criteria. So WIM stands for warts, hypogamma globulemia, infections, and myelocathexis, or retention of neutrophils in the bone marrow. Um, so we know a lot about CXCR4 biology and the mechanism of disease in these patients now. So normally as a final checkpoint before exiting the bone marrow, uh, mature B cells and neutrophils upregulate CXCR4 expression. Um, they bind to um, CXCL12 on the bone marrow stroma, and this sends a signaling cascade for cells to exit into the periphery. But in WIM patients, 
the block in CXCR4 signaling means that the neutrophils and the B cells still bind to the stroma, but they're essentially unable to exit the bone marrow. And for those few B cells that are able to egress, they don't migrate appropriately in the spleen, in the lymph nodes during immune responses. They can't re-enter the bone marrow to reside as long-lived plasma cells. And all of this leads to a profound lymphopenia and antibody deficiency. So it's really understanding this mechanism that's allowed a repurposing of an already approved drug as a targeted therapy. So a small molecule, um, CXCR4 um, antagonist, so I should say antagonist, uh, used previously to mobilize hemopoietic stem cells in cancer patients um, was used in a clinical trial here. And it, um, it specifically restores um, the leukocyte defect in patients well above what was previous standard therapy of GCSF in these patients. And I've shown here for neutrophils, B cells, CD4 and NK cells. Um, Importantly, all of these cells are functionally normal. It was purely a defect in cell migration and trafficking. I'll also note that there was actually only 80 patient, WIM patients uh, described worldwide at the time. Um, like most primary immunodeficiencies, it's grossly underdiagnosed. And really, from our collective sequencing efforts, we've already identified another five patients in Victoria alone. I think there's over 40 others in Australia. Um, a clinical trial is now completed of an oral antagonist alternative to Pluxifor, um, in uh, at St Vincent's here in Melbourne. Um, the proman from our family was um, enrolled in this study and the outcomes looked really good. Um, and there's plans to include other individuals and young people with WIM across multiple sites soon. So importantly, we also know that WIM patients have a specific susceptibility to um, warts and um, HPV infection, and um, patients therefore have a higher risk of developing cervical cancer. So the index patient in our study has had HPV infection, and on further investigations, she did have a cervical phenotype that was not previously linked to her primary immunodeficiency, but now we clearly know it is. Um, and even more importantly, her two young daughters, who would not have normally been vaccinated with um, Gardasil, um, have received the vaccination given um, their diagnosis of CVID, they normally wouldn't have been vaccinated. Um, but there was a study that showed that WIM patients can actually make sufficient protective antibody after repeated vaccine boosters. Um, so now all three have received multiple vaccines um, and are being monitored. Oh, yeah. So, you know, there's lots of these cases. Um, so for over the last few years, you know, we've really championed these cases to government uh, to fund genomic sequencing as part of standard care for primary immunodeficiency. Um, I've highlighted a few of these clinical genomics initiatives that I'm involved in um, across Australia here. And it's really together that these projects have enabled us to, to streamline our clinical genomics pipeline, to focus on the research in the lab um, and the discovery to, towards better outcomes for patients. So back to CVID. We know many genes can cause CVID. And I'm going to tell you a few of the genotypes and phenotypes of some of these, which can be grouped into defects in genes linked in uh, a couple of immunological pathways. So the first is a syndrome uh, named activated PI3 kinase delta syndrome or APDS, and it's due to mutations in gene um, PI3CD or PIK3R1. So the PI3K proteins um, are essential signaling proteins of B cells and T cells. And really they form a complex network that is important for B, -tel B cells and T cells at steady state. Uh, mutations in these genes were first discovered in CVID patients, um, but also some other primary you know, immunodeficiencies as well, such as um, combined immunodeficiencies, hyper IgM syndromes. So patients um, with activated PI3 kinase delta syndrome have a variable phenotype. Uh, some of the key features that may be present are shown here. 
Um, there's over 50 patients um, identified worldwide. And importantly, this group of patients, they have an increased risk of malignancy, particularly um, B-cell lymphoma, even those with a, a mild um, phenotype. The mutation that causes this um, primary immunodeficiency um, actually is an activating gain of function mutation in the PIK3CD gene. Um, this is a gain of function because it results in constitutive signaling via this pathway that causes um, a number of T cell B cell defects, um, both in, in number and function. So overall, patients have normal numbers of B cells, which I'm showing on the left, but they have a specific increase in immature transitional B cells and reduced naive and memory B cell compartment. So activating PI3K um, disease is an example of where uh, the mechanism disease of disease was very quickly defined, and it was largely elucidated based on a mouse model phenotype. Um, as well as previous understanding of the basic biology. And I'm showing here some data of the effect of a, a, a P110 delta inhibitor in, in the pathway in reducing IgG um, levels in the control, but increasing it in the PIK3D, um, PI3KD uh, model. So this really led to uh, a quick implementation of a targeted therapy. So repurposing existing drugs uh, that specifically targets the pathway of interest, which is the mTOR pathway um, and these PIK3CD subunits. So this is now approved for use in these patients to effectively um, treat many of the different clinical symptoms of the disease, such as hypogammaglobulinemia, splenomegaly, the respiratory systems as well symptoms, sorry, as well. Um, the next primary immunodeficiency disorder or CBID um, disorder I'll, I'll, I'll talk about is a CTLA-4 haploinsufficiency. So this was first identified in CBID patients, but as per the activated PI3 kinase delta syndrome, um, it's now considered a separate and distinct immune dysregulation syndrome. Um, the typical features are multi-organ autoimmunity, recurrent infections, lymphoproliferation, spermomegaly, um, often bone marrow failure, um, and, and T-cell and B-cell defects. Um, typically, it's onset in older children, teenagers, and young adults, and malignancy is reported in um, just under 15% of patients, which there's a suspicion that it might be... Um, um, EBV associated as well. So regulatory Tregs, uh, regulatory T cells or Tregs are critical in putting on the brakes of the immune system after an infection is cleared um, to avoid autoimmunity, to avoid self-reactivity. So normally for a T cell to become activated, it must receive two signals, um, MHC and foreign antigen, plus either CD80 or CD86. Uh, when Tregs become activated, they upregulate CTLA-4 expression on their cell surface, and this blocks the CD80, CD86 signal on the antigen-presenting cell, which blocks the T-cell activation. And, and really, this is a key immune checkpoint. Another thing to note is that CTLA-4 uh, expression is actually recycled inside cell lysosomes. So although the numbers of the Tregs are largely normal in people with um, CTLA-4 mutations, they have reduced CTLA-4 expression on their cell surface when they're activated. And that's shown here on the histogram on the right. The um, CTLA-4 expression in pink in the patient um, with reduced CTLA-4 expression on the T cells after activation. And they also have a significant reduction in that suppressive T cell um, function. But for many, but as, as for many primary immunodeficiencies, the mutation was also identified in asymptomatic family members with about 70% penetrance, meaning the clinical disease was in 70% um, of people and 30% um, had no clinical signs of disease. So these asymptomatic characters, uh, ca carriers um, also showed a functionally reduced CTA4 expression reduced T cell function, but it was less severe. 
Um, of course, given the variable age of disease onset in this patient group, it is of course possible that some may develop disease later in life. But the good news is that there's a specific targeted therapy that can be used to correct this gene defect. So abatacept is actually a CTLA-4 um, immunoglobulin fusion drug, and it was previously approved to treat autoimmune disease, particularly rheumatoid arthritis, as a, um, as a second line therapy if the patient was unresponsive to TNF therapy. So in the context of uh, CTLA-4 haploinsufficiency, um, treatment with abatacept results in, you know, stabilization of the cytopenias as well as improvement of the gut symptoms, largely brain lesions, lesions and splenomegaly. So it's incredibly effective um, against many of the symptoms associated with this disorder. So shortly after CTLA-4 deficiency was identified, um, patients were also identified with gene lesions in a related gene, LRBA. So these patients also had a variable clinical phenotype, but it largely overlapped with CTLA-4 deficient patients. So they had the autoimmune cytopenias, um, the splenomegaly, hypogammaglobulinemia, um, the organ-specific autoimmunity, the lymphocytic infiltration of the non-lymphoid organs, um, but they also had an increased risk of lymphoma, as well as the unique feature of early onset and very severe autoimmunity. So we already knew a lot about this pathway. Um, we previously knew that LRBA is an important protein um, for recycling CTLA-4 expression. So researchers very quickly hypothesized that these patients may have a secondary loss of CTLA-4 expression because of disruptions to that internal trafficking via their LRBA uh, mutations. So of course, abatacept was presented as a possible precision therapy also for these patients. Um, and it worked really well. So I'm just showing here some CT scans of, of three LRBA deficient patients before and after the abatacept treatment. So the arrows are just highlighting um, examples of lung disease improvement before and after treatment that I hope you can see the difference there. And then on the right, um, there's basically, you know, it, it this is just showing four different pulmonary function tests. And each, you can see that line going up, showing improvement in patients um, after the treatment with abatacept. So this knowledge, this discovery led to these syndromes being linked. Um, they were now given a new name each. Um, then they also, um, this renaming removed them from the classification of CVID. So CTLA-4 deficiency can be referred to as CHI which you know, we can all get behind. It stands for CTLA-4 haploinsufficiency with autoimmune filtration. Um, but the name for the LRBA deficiency, LATE, is a bit cringy. Um, and this stands for LRBA deficiency with autoantibodies, T cell regulatory defects, autoimmune infiltration, and enteropathy, um, which is a bit of a mouthful. But I suppose if it raises awareness under physicians, we, we can all give it a pass. Finally, I just wanted to spend a few minutes to tell you a little bit about the NF-kappa B defects that lead to antibody deficiency. So NF-kappa B is, is probably a transcription factor that um, many of you have heard of. It actually refers to a family of transcription factors that regulates um, a diverse uh, suite of, of biological processes. So NF-kappa B signaling is really a major inflammatory hub that integrates lots of signals downstream of many different immune cells, T cells, B cells, monocytes, and depending on that signaling context, it can have you know, many effect on, on over 500 genes, including um, genes involved in inflammation, B cell development, self-survival, antibody production, tolerance to self-antigens, and, and cell death. So there's been a number of primary immunodeficiencies identified, both up and downstream of NF-kappa B signaling. And I'm showing here NF-kappa B signaling in a B cell. Uh, so the B cell's the cell below in the blue, um, and that's following engagement with a helper T cell at the top um, during an immune response. And the primary immunodeficiencies that have been identified 
um, are highlighted in yellow. And I'll just draw your attention to some of the genes that encode the NF-kappa B signaling proteins here. Um, the NF-kappa B2 signaling pathway is activated by a limited set of receptors, and the other, the canonical NF-kappa B1 signaling pathway, is really targeted by a, a wide number of receptors, including, you know, the B cell receptor um, complex, the T cell receptor, um, patho pathogen recognition, toll-like receptors, um, and so on. So in 2015, we identified an NF-kappa B1 deficiency um, in a family from Melbourne by um, exome sequencing. And when we performed the familial segregation at the time, we confirmed the variant was present in the proband, uh, in her mother, uh, both of whom were diagnosed with pretty late onset CVID in their 40s, and it wasn't carried by any other um, healthy family members. We had um, access to their um, genomic DNA. But it was present in her ostensibly healthy daughter. So this was a woman in her late 20s with a history of mild recurrent infection. IgA levels were a little low. Um, so when she was called back into the clinic, her IgG levels um, were tested and they had actually just dropped below that diagnostic cutoff. She was diagnosed with CVID and, and immediately received immunoglobulin replacement um, therapy. And this was really critical because at the time she was actually four months pregnant, so was able to give those protective antibodies um, to her developing baby. So it was about this time or, or shortly after that we were contacted by colleagues in um, Freiburg about this family. And as it turns out, they were actually part of a larger extended Dutch kindred that had been under investigation by their group for the last 10 years. And they had simultaneously identified the same mutation by exome sequencing. So the interesting thing is that they previously identified um, NF-kappa B1 as one of the 10 candidate genes, um, and they'd actually sequenced this gene and they'd missed the mutation given its position. It was a splice variant um, that I think was four base pairs um, after the end of the exon. So in addition to our German colleagues, through our network, we also worked with some other um, collaborators in New Zealand, um, as well as the Netherlands. And together we'd identified a number of families with different mutations. And it was a really global effort in describing this new disease, this new deficiency. And as was the case for the PI3 kinase and the CTLA4 deficient um, patients that were described. Uh, it was obviously a really wonderful collaboration. Uh, we performed the functional validation experiments here um, at WeHine. I'll, I'll show you one of the key experiments here. So NF-kappa B signaling was disrupted in cells from the patients and not in the healthy family members or the unrelated healthy donors. But what I'm showing you here is that if NF-kappa B1 full length wild type protein is overexpressed in a cell line, you can see it lighting up in the cell. Um, and when NF-kappa B1 is processed, um, which you can see on the right, normally after activation, it aggregates in the nucleus. Um, and that's where it initiates its downstream cell functions. But if we overexpress the mutant protein, we could see very little of it in the cell and almost none of it was processed to the nucleus of the cell. And this was one of the key experiments that proved um, the pathogenicity of, of these variants. So I won't go into the data since the paper's published, but just to note that, you know, in this in this particular paper, our, our work in these three families was the first reported case of NF-kappa B1 haploinsufficiency in CBID. Uh, there was a number of subsequent reports and case studies that came out that really expanded the, the spectrum of disease associated with NF-kappa B uh, deficiency from that original report. Um, what we didn't know at the time is that it would actually eventually account for the single biggest genetic cause of CVID worldwide. And it really ignited a suite of investigations into uh, NF-kappa B1 and NF-kappa B2 deficiency. But there are a few buts. Um, from a global genotype, phenotype collection, it became really clear that clinically, NF-kappa B1 deficient patients were pretty indistinguishable from CBID. Um, there was a variable range of clinical presentations, and really, this largely represents that breakdown of complications in CBID I showed you earlier. 
There are some unique features of the NF-kappa-B2 deficiency, such as early onset disease or potentially a pituitary deficiency or injury, adrenal insufficiency in, in about three quarters of patients. Um, and we've described a severe neurological abnormality in, in patients as well. Importantly, there's currently no targeted therapy to directly treat these complications, or at least nothing immediately obvious from the genetic lesion. Um, I'll just note that we did report a case of divergent uh, clinical and immunological phenotype in a single family. It was two sisters with a novel NF-kappa B2 deficiency. Um, we've since identified uh, many more people with NFKB1 and two mutations in our local cohort, and as I've told you, worldwide as well. Um, you know, from some of our work, it's really become increasingly clear that the defect is, is highly cell-specific in different individuals, and we're continuing to work on, on different aspects of this deficiency to try and um, get to some sort of targeted therapy for patients. So the first thing we're trying to do is actually improve our variant prediction. So there's actually no good way right now to predict the pathogenicity of new variants we find in NF-kappa B1 or NF-kappa B2. Um, for variants that cause, you know, significantly truncated protein or, or splicing, we can confirm them very easily by protein expression or RNA sequencing. But, but most of the variants we identify clinically, they're missense variant. Um, and most of them are classed as variants of uncertain significance. You know, e the pathogenic variants are evenly distributed throughout the gene, as are these variants of uncertain significance. And we haven't yet found any hotspots or any link to different clinical phenotypes. So previously what we would do is we would actually investigate each of these variant one by one in patient cells or in cell lines to functionally validate and prove that that particular variant causes disease. So of course, as you can imagine, this approach is very expensive and is painstakingly low throughput. So we've been developing a new genomics pipeline that makes use of deep mutational scanning technology to preemptively test every possible genetic variant in the NFKB1 and NFKB2 genes. And we're doing this in collaborations with WeHi's new MAF facility. So this is the multiplexed assay technology hub, um, which is co-led by Melissa Call and Alan Rubin. So the basic premise of this sort of approach is that we make libraries that express every possible single amino acid missense or nonsense variant. And we express these in our favorite cell lines, for example, a HEC 293 T cell. We run these cells each of them expresses a single variant through our functional assay of choice. Um, for us, it's a series of flow-based um, assays to test the signaling and expression function. We then sort and sequence the barcoded cells, and we end up with um, a variant function map or a heat map of, you know, how every possible genetic variant, uh, genetic mutation in our gene of interest might affect CVID function in that disease context. So the idea is we can use this tool clinically when we do identify that variant of uncertain significance in a, in a patient in the future to help predict its classification. So that's sort of the diagnosis side of things. In terms of um, the treatments, you know, one of the major reasons we haven't yet developed a targeted therapy for these patients is, you know, despite knowing a lot about NF-kappa B signaling, as I've told you, NF-kappa B signaling is, is a major inflammatory hub. Um, it integrates many signals downstream of immune cells. Um, and given its ubiquitous expression and many different outcomes of signaling, it's, you know, no big surprise, it's a highly regulated um, in a really complex way. There's lots of inhibitor proteins. Um, there's lots of feedback mechanisms to really keep it in check to ensure it's um, appropriate expression in the right context at the right time. Um, there's six inhibitor proteins so far identified to constrain um, the expression of NF-kappa B1 and NF-kappa B2 um, in the steady state. And we've identified patients with defects in one of these inhibitors that's really giving us unique insights into the possible pathways we can target therapeutically in these patients.
Uh, we're now using multiple approaches, including transcriptomics, you know, gene expression analysis to map and pinpoint pathway defects in different lymphoid populations in patient cells. And, and so we really have the potential to target inflammation directly in this pathway rather than, than blanket immunosuppression, which is the current treatment strategy for many patients. Um, and this is exciting because it presents the potential for early targeted intervention that may prevent the comorbidities and, and complications we've seen in many patients and, and, and sadly um, early and untimely death. Um, but obviously we have a ways to go. So, you know, just to, to sum up, uh, genomics approaches clearly have enormous impact and potential to chain practice. Um, you know, in our Melbourne Genomics clinical study, uh, we showed application of clinical genomics increased the diagnostic rate fivefold over standard care. Uh, we were able to implement precision treatment for half of the patients diagnosed in that study, <clears throat> including curative stem cell transplantation in kids and teenagers who otherwise would never have been transplanted. Um, we've identified new diseases, uh, new susceptibilities and, and potential therapeutics in, in many cases. <clears throat> Genomics obviously has the power, as I've shown you again and again, for early, accurate, timely, and, and perhaps an unexpected diagnosis that doesn't fit with the classical clinical presentation. So we're continually expanding the spectrum of disease. Um, and of course, those early interventions can really change the course of, of patients in terms of their complications and improvement of, of outcomes. <clears throat> But it's not always this straightforward to solve. You know, with more patients identified in our worldwide network, it's becoming increasingly clear that the spectrum of disease, even within a genotype, is quite broad. Uh, we really must understand that underlying mechanism of disease if we're going to identify pathways to target therapeutically, like I showed you with the CTLA-4 deficiency or the activating PI3 kinase um, syndromes. <clears throat> And I think this is where the multi-omic platforms are really coming into their own, particularly in CBID, by specifically identifying disrupted proteins or even discrete pathways in patients, we can identify new targets to leverage therapeutically to better stratify patients who will respond to those therapies and um, better manage their complex disease. But of course, this requires many specialties and expertise um, coming together and of course, genomic champions. Um, the quality of that clinical variant curation and diagnosis is of course only commensurate to the quality of clinical data collected of the functional validation that um, underlies specific variants. Um, of course, we increasingly see in complex immune diseases that inborn errors in a single gene can have a variety of clinical context uh, consequences. And equally, a seemingly singular disease phenotype may be explained by many genes. So it really comes back to this idea of diagnosis and treatment of immune disorders by that virtuous cycle of understanding genomics and disease mechanisms um, by that, you know, discrete application of genetics, genomics, transcriptomics that always comes back to the patient. So with that, it just remains for me to acknowledge my team at WeHi, uh, past and present, um, our research collaborators, our clinical partners in particular, who have been so generous uh, with clinical samples and expertise and collaboration. I also want to acknowledge the patients and families who've contributed to our studies and all of the studies that I've shown you today um, that really form the foundation of all research and um, for us as well, the generous funders and supporters of our project. So thank you. <laughs>